Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, how time series is all hype and you shouldn't do it. Um, I'm, my name is Mike Zorn, and I'm a software architect here at LaunchDarkly. Um, this title is a little clickbaity. Uh, I mostly uh, wrote it like that. Since this is a San Francisco meetup and we're in Oakland, got to give some kind of incentive to go across the bay. Uh, the real title, uh oh. Oh, the real title is Time Series is Bad for Use Cases That It's Bad For, um, which is maybe a little bit less interesting. Um, but the idea for this talk, um, oh, is, is it mine? Okay, there you go. Um, uh, I was, so I read this quote from Toto Wolf in the, uh, in the profile of him in the New Yorker. Uh, you really come back from a race weekend where you've won, and you say, why the F did we win? Um, you know, he's trying to convey that you learn more from failure than you learn from success often. Uh, and this talk is mostly about um, failures we had to, um, you know, query our data efficiently um, and less focused on how we queried it efficiently. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to start off with uh, talking about a, a time series data use case that worked really well for us um, and uh, how it inspired some time series data use cases that didn't work out as well for us. Um, and then we'll go through a bunch of um, different strategies we tried to make that not as good use case um, performant, um, but mostly failures. Okay, so. Um, this is a um, chart where the, the boxes represent like rows you would see in your database uh, and they're organized um, uh, by time because it's time series data. So the idea here, um, we're recording data that we would use to like bill our customers for how many events they send. Um, you know, each row is recording the amount of events that were um, sent uh, during that, at that moment in time. And the data is, um, you know, organized together on disks so that um, data, um, you know, that occurred at a similar time as near data that occurred um, at that time. Um, so it kind of looks like this maybe, where, you know, every hour you have a new chunk of data. Um, so if we need to do a query where we figure out how many events were sent in each hour, uh, it's really efficient because you know, the data that is in that hour is near the other data in that hour on disk. So we can easily aggregate, you know, five, 14, and two for those three hours. And then if we want to get the uh, total, um, we uh, can uh, just add the numbers, which is pretty easy. And then we end up with 21. So that works uh, really well. You know, we're able to get the data for each hour very efficiently. And then if we want to get the grand total, we just sum it up, which is pretty easy. Um, and that uh, success inspired us to um, extend this time series data uh, usage to experimentation data. Oh. OK. Um, so in this scenario, each row represents a user um, entering an experiment, um, or a user being exposed to experiment. Um, and it's also organized by time. So, um, you know, uh, we have Alice all the way on the far left, so she saw the experiment first, and then she came back and also saw the experiment again, so she's recorded multiple times each time she uh, interacted with the experiment. Um, and then, you know, this, this data is similarly organized on disk, you know, it's sim like uh, close to each other time-wise. Um, so if we want to figure out how many people um, were exposed to the experiment in a given hour. It's pretty easy. We can just do a, a query for each hour, and we end up with some numbers. Um, but if we wanted to figure out how many people were exposed to an experiment across the time period, it's not as easy because we have uh, duplicates in our data. Um, you know, Alice is in here a few times. Uh, so as a result, we can't just sum these numbers together like we were able to, um, for the other use case, we are just left with guessing. Um, but we can actually you know, get all of the data together um, and then uh, 
you know, do a sort of the data to count um, the number of like distinct people that saw the experiment. Um, and if we do that, we end up with uh, six. So after we sort the data, you know, it's pretty easy to just scan through it after it's sorted and increment some counter uh, for each, uh, you know, new uh, user that you see, and then you end up with six. Um, but there is a problem with this um, for a data set that is larger than six, um, which is that sort, when you have a lot of rows, gets really expensive. Um, so here is an example of a real query plan um, that uses this methodology, and you can see that we are doing a sort that is requiring us to, um, uh, you know, get out of main memory and start doing the sort on disk. So we, we need half a gigabyte of disk space to do this sort. Um, and as you might imagine, that's very slow. Um, so once you have that, oh yeah. This is all relational data and indexes and rows. Did you, don't you actually do like blobs and? Oh yeah, 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 great question. So the question was, is this all relational data? And yeah, the, so for this talk, I should have said this earlier, but uh, this is all a Postgres um, oh. database. Can I say two words to you? Sure. One is Neo4j. <laughs> Second word is gun.echo, Mike's hyper, Mark Nadal's hypergraph database, open source, 60 million users. That was more than two words. Um, but <laughs> <none. laughs> okay. All right. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, like I was saying, this uh, is very slow because we have to go to disk to do this sort. Um, so um, that's not great. What are some alternatives we can do to uh, compute this? Um, you know, uh, count across the time range. Um, so one thing we can do is use. Um, Hyperlog logs. Um, this is a, if you're not familiar with it, it's a data structure um, that has a fixed size that you can use to approximate uh, the cardinality of some set. Um, and a really nice property it has is it can be merged efficiently. Um, so what we can do is use hyperlog logs to help us solve this problem. Uh, and if we do that, it looks like this. So we've got. Um, you know, that data is organized again on disk, uh, like within where the data in each hour is close to each other. So we can just compute a hyperlog log for each hour, and that's pretty efficient. And then we can just merge those hyperlog logs together, uh, and we get an answer that tells us that this set is approximately six. Um, unfortunately, this is um, an experimentation use case. So we then have to account for this approximately in our um, statistics, which we, we can do, um, but there are some problems. Uh, because we've int added this approximation, um, now um, customers that are using experimentation uh, need to have like much higher sample sizes than they would expect to get st statistical significance um, for the same experiment. So uh, this is from a real support ticket, unfortunately. Um, where on the top, you can see that they have about um, 6,000 uh, users in each uh, treatment of their experiment. Uh, and it does not have statistical significance. But this sample size calculator they used, um, which is correct, says that they should have statistical significance at this point. Um, and uh, the reason for this is because we had to account for the approximation, the hyperlog log. Um, uh, add or the uncertainty the hyperlog log added to our result. Um, so this didn't quite work uh, for that reason. So at this point, we've tried a couple things. Um, oh, I, actually, I forgot about one detail. One thing we could do with that sort that was half a gig, we could just get bigger instances, but um, the mat, like the cost doesn't work out very well. You quickly are going to spend like, I think the it worked out to like twenty thousand dollars per month per customer. Uh, that we had an experiment which was uh, not above water for us. So we can't solve the problem with hardware, and we uh, weren't able to use hyperlog logs. Sorry. Okay. All right. We got some opinions from the audience. Uh, okay. So one thing we can do. Um, to make count distinct fast, 
is to not do it. Um, and let's try that. So we've got the data um, you know, in the time series arrangement here. Um, and um, one thing we can do is to try to reorient this so that instead of having one row per exposure to the experiment, we have um, one row uh, per user in the experiment, and then we won't have to do this count distinct. Um, so what we can do, what the heck? Okay, so um, when we do that, what we can do is store the, um, the time data as an array in Postgres. So these little stars represent what were our rows previously, um, and the yellow um, squares are still the, the rows. So now we have um, just six rows for all the people in our experiment, um, but we still have the time data um, stored in those rows in the format of, a, of an array. Um, and this uh, works pretty well because now instead of um, doing a count distinct where we have to sort everything, uh, we just can do a count. The, the data doesn't have any duplicates, right? Um, Uh, and yes, it does in fact work great. Um, this is a query plan for a similar query um, uh, using this schema, uh, and it um, you know executes in a couple seconds, which for an experiment with a few million people in it is is acceptable. Um, the previous query was executing in like minutes, um, so this is pretty good. Um, but we have a bit of a problem because we need to do um, time-based queries still. Um, so we probably need to index that timestamp array. Um, so how do we go about that? Um, so you know we've got this row of Alice, and she has like been exposed to the experiment three times, represented in this uh, array. Um, how do we make an index on that? Uh, one strange feature that Postgres has is support for um, polygon data. Um, so what you could do is um, make a polygon in this strange shape to represent your um, time data. And then you can intersect that with the time range you want to query. And strangely, in Postgres, there is actually a, um, this is an indexable operation. So you can make an index that would satisfy this query. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, is not, it does not work out quite so well in practice. So the reason for this is, Postgres, if you're unfamiliar, has um, two really interesting index types. There's gin and there's gist. Um, one is a generalized search tree, and the other one's a generalized inverted index. And what's kind of cool is like, it's like a framework for indexes. So you can, um, for you know, if you're extending Postgres to add a new data type, you can kind of plug into this indexing framework, and uh, it will let you uh, create inverted indexes and search trees for your you know, new esoteric data type. Um, and the gist index is supported for um, polygon data. So you can create a gist index on that polygon shape I just showed you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, gist indexes are um, lossy. So um, they have to be really carefully tuned um, because they kind of operate like a bloom filter where you um, will you know, query the data from the index, but then you have to recheck Every row um, that matched that like was satisfied by the index um, because it could be a false match. Um, so this um, doesn't work great for this use case because we end up having to do a lot of um, random uh, fet scans of the, or we have to do a lot of random fetches from this index to verify that they match. Um, and then this basically just devolves to like a random scan of our table, which is even slower than. Um, you know, the, the previous option we had. So uh, one thing we could try is using an inverted index to, um, you know, satisfy these time range queries. Um, unfortunately, um, you cannot uh, satisfy, like, range queries with an inverted index um, generally. But the one thing I realized was that you, there are range queries in Elasticsearch. And uh, Elasticsearch is just a big inverted index that's distributed across some computers. Um, so I did some digging in the Elasticsearch docs, and uh, apparently they have this kind of novel way where they uh, implement inverted the range queries in the inverted index. They use like um, these uh, try things. Um, so I adapted that approach to Postgres through this um, 
strange uh, SQL query that has a lot of bit shifts in it. Um, and it actually like worked. Uh, the only problem was that um, it was still really slow because um, you just ended up doing another kind of random scan of the table. Um, there's uh, no way you can do like a index only scan of an inverted index in Postgres because um, the uh, index only contains the tokens for the data, uh, not the data itself. Um, so you can't like satisfy the queries just from the index and you end up having to like go to disk randomly again and it's very, very poor performance. Um, so none of these worked. Um, and then I got frustrated and I was like, why do we even have indexes? This is very frustrating to try to index this strange data. Um, and then I was, you know, thinking, what are indexes? Um, you know, if I want to cook uh, a fish dinner, you know, I've got a fish and I've got my cookbook. I got two ways to find ways to cook that fish dinner. I could read the entire book um, and then, you know, find the recipes that are for fish. Uh, that would be your, like, sequential scan of the table. Um, the other option is I could use the index at the back and then I find fish in the index, and I've got a couple of uh, uh, pages that are for fish. And then I can go read those pages. Uh, you know, I have to read the entire page because I'm a, a, a computer, not a human. Um, and I'll see that there's, um, you know, a bunch of recipes and uh, on these pages, and I can filter out um, the recipes that are not for um, uh, for fish like this chicken and the steak recipe. Um, so what the index is really doing there is letting me minimize the amount of pages I have to read in order to figure out how to cook uh, my dinner. Um, I don't really need like a second index on almonds to figure out that I can cook trout almondine uh, with my fish. Um, so um, with that fact in mind, um, I real we, the, it turns out that we didn't need that timestamp index at all. Uh, we could just uh, use the uh, index we already had, and since we could return all the experiment results in a reasonable amount of time, um, uh, we can also just filter those results um, to um, not have uh, you know things from outside of the time range. Um, and this is a you know picture of the, that query and the query plan. The query is a little bit strange since the um, the times are inside of an array. There's this weird little unnest trick. But this is basically just like getting all of the, um, the data that is newer than that uh, timestamp in the query. And then you can see in the, the query plan that it, um, you know, it executes in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and it has this uh, filter. Um, and this is um, removing the rows that are too old to satisfy the query. Um, and that is how we uh, sped up our experimentation queries. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mike. Anybody has a question, you can raise the hand. I can pass the mic. Oh, OK. Sorry. And this is a positive. I'm not trying. Like, this is extremely well done to deal with relational database foo. And I'm an ex-member of the founding LAMP stack meet up in San Francisco. That's why we went round relational, because you get into an issue where you have to climb the index. And structurally, MySQL and other tools like Postgres that make you do that, hit it in index. Being able to point to blobs and other things and tags and not that are pre-indexed by pointing to the tags, it'll save you all this performance. That's what Neo4j and other things do. And um, there are even connectors people were written to Postgres and to be able to deal with that, because you just never. And the 20,000, is that a petabyte or a terabyte? Or for instance, or for customer, because that oh, price sounds really oh, high. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was kind of like a back of the net. That so the question was around like where I made that offhand reference to costing twenty thousand dollars per customer. Yeah. Uh, to satisfy the query originally, um, and that was like we needed. So if you wanted to get an instance with enough RAM to put, have, have like gigabyte? half a yeah. gigabyte of working memory per connection, you end up needing like a twenty terabyte instance to just satisfy like twenty connections. Because um, for Postgres, at least, like you need to allocate that working memory to each connection. So you you need a lot of it, which is why yeah. generally the working memory is pretty small, and why if to do a big sort, you'd have to go to disk a lot. 
You can't um, even do a good virtual machine structure for this. This is a, this is another reason we've never liked it. So um, database guy, I've done stuff from back in the old IBM DB2 days, and I love the new ones. And I, this is just madness. So you, you should look at switching for this type of problems. Even index oh, okay. problems, you can map them to tags, which will point to like an index. If you break them out in the elements, like you did a good job structuring them in the data structure, but it's going to kill you on costs. You can't stay on this infrastructure. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's working pretty well for us right now. Um, I'll, I'll say that. Um, any other questions? Yeah, there's a question from online. Is that as a, I'm trying to read it. Uh, regarding the last technique presented, was it the filter that speed up the query or is the hash? Oh, so the, um, the thing that sped up the query was um, the indexing strategy introduced earlier. Um, and then it just turned out that, that executing that filter didn't add a ton of cost to the query. Um, so we didn't need like a second index uh, to avoid the filter. Okay. Anybody from online has questions? I, I know it's kind of hard because we couldn't see the uh, uh, comments on, until we see the computer. So oh, yeah. if you can just, uh, if you possible, you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Oh yeah. So the question was, um, uh, yeah. is the, uh, half a second, um, query performance good enough for us? And the answer is yes. Like, um, this is rendering like experiment results. So this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, this is like an analytics query that you're executing pretty rarely. So yeah, 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 yeah. If it's just like, uh, Oh, like I want to like, you know, see if this users in the database half a second is pretty bad, but for this use case, it's pretty good. Rep. They would give you better pricing because of your scale. I know this. Like that should be that. that. Even in post reg and memory, it should be way cheaper for you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This workload does not cost. Uh, uh, or like this. Yeah, we we don't need to spend twenty thousand dollars per customer per month for this workload. It's much cheaper than that. Uh, I got a question. So uh, this is a totally naive question. So since you're dealing with uh, time series data, why not just start with a time series database? Oh yeah. So. Um, we actually, um, we're using a, um, uh, a time series extension for the Postgres database that does this really cool, like uh, table partitioning by time to keep the data, um, like, uh, you know, co-located in disk for time. The problem was really just that like our experimentation use case was like quite poorly suited to, um, the time series data structure. Got it. Thank you. A uh, question from the chat, why not just use Elasticsearch? And there was also a clarification of what was the database technology that was mentioned before. Was it Neo4j? Neo4j was one. Sorry, so you check out the project, uh, Mark and all these guys at Gun. Um, they produce Gun.echo. They are seeing 10 million queries in 0 0.01 seconds on old hardware, legacy hardware. Pre, per yeah, and the other question was why not just use um, Elasticsearch for this? Um, and that's kind of an interesting question. Like, I think that you could use Elasticsearch to solve this type of problem um, just fine. Uh, I think that's like a reasonable option. Um, for us, um, you know, we wanted to use uh, Postgres because kind of based on our, our team's uh, skill sets, um, and um, you know, that, that, that I think was I, yeah. I, 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 this was a little while ago, so I can't um, comment exactly on the technology decision we made. But uh, yeah, post, uh, Elasticsearch would be a fine option. I think that's the last question, right? Anybody? Any? Any online? Uh, can you share at a high level into why you chose to use the hyperlog log data structure? Were there other just construction? Uh, were there other data structures considered? Oh yeah, so the um, yeah the hyperlog log we tried to use um, just because it like provided that um, fixed size um, 
estimation of the the size of the or like fixed size and memory estimation of the like size of the set of people that were exposed to an experiment, and we could merge them efficiently. Um, so that made it so that when we do the you know the count of all the people in the data set, um, we were able to um, instead of doing like a big expensive sort, we can just aggregate these hyperlog logs together, and that operation is very cheap. So that, that's why we use we tried to use hyperlog logs, but um, as I showed the um, Hyperlog logs didn't um, enmesh very well with our experimentation statistics, um, so it wasn't suitable for this use case. But typically, if you're doing like a um, something where you need to count distinct, um, hyperlog logs are a great uh, solution. Cool. Well, thanks so much for all the good questions. All right. Thank you, Mike, for that great presentation. Uh, we'll take a one minute break because I see that our um, second speaker isn't here yet, but Blake will be speaking in just a minute. Uh, in the meantime, I'll tell you a little bit about LaunchDarkly. Um, LaunchDarkly is a company that's uh, around 10 years old now. We build feature flags. Um, if you've ever built a feature flagging product and tried to scale it, you know how hard it is. Um, so if you're interested in feature flagging, check out our product. As I said, we work on the experimentation team, so if um, that's also a hard product to build. I've built experimentation systems at a couple of companies, uh, and we sell it as a service. So if it's something that your team is looking to do, check us out. Um, and at the end, we'll share the QR code again for people who are interested in uh, careers at LaunchDarkly. But next up, uh, we have Blake talking about Flink. All right, yep. Hello. All right, uh, thanks, Robert. Uh, like Robert said, I'll be going over um, performance tuning of streaming applications, and specifically, we'll be focusing on Apache Flink, which is the framework we use here at LaunchDarkly. So to start with, we'll be reviewing what Apache Flink is. For those who aren't very familiar with it, um, we'll be going over some performance pitfalls that most people who work with Flink are likely to encounter. And then we'll just be discussing solutions that we found for these issues and going through an example of Flink usage at LaunchDarkly. Um, OK, so to start with, Apache Flink is um, one of the latest generation of streaming framework applications. It supports ingesting data through a variety of connectors like Kafka, Kinesis, S3, et cetera. And like many of streaming frameworks these days, it supports uh, exactly once uh, processing semantics via a checkpointing algorithm. And you can compare it to its contemporaries of like Apache Storm and Spark. And I have not done much research on these, but a brief Googling suggests that some of the concepts map onto each other. So as a high level architecture overview of Flink, which is all we'll be getting into, you have, and again, these concepts map onto most streaming frameworks. You have something that's coordinating work. In this case, it's called a job manager. And then you have the worker threads or posts, nodes. Uh, these are called task managers in Flink. And there's some coordinated data store, which is called a snapshot store here. Uh, that contains, for example, the checkpoint state, things that keep the whole application in sync. Some basic terms that I'll be referring to throughout the presentation. Um, and sorry to bore anyone who already knows Flink. Uh, we have operators. This is like the logical unit of defining how data is transformed or processed, basically the code of your Flink application. Tasks are scheduled units of an operator. So um, this is basically a concrete instance of a Flink uh, unit of work. Sources are the things that read data out of uh, your data source. And syncs are what the, the tasks, basically, that are writing to, the, to your destination. So 
some more terms. Data streams are buffer channels. It's like a flink primitive data type that allows tasks to communicate with each other. This can happen over the network or within a single JVM. Um, you have flink state. This is a managed consistent view of uh, state that certain operators can access. You have this term time characteristic. This refers to different schemes of time progression that you can use for a Flink application. Um, the two available characteristics are called processing and event time. Uh, processing meaning wall clock time. Um, event referring to timestamps that are marked on your data uh, elements. This term watermark refers to the current point in time uh, known to an operator in a Flink application, basically a low watermark for timestamp uh, beyond which all records are assumed to have a timestamp greater or equal to. And this term timer, um, these are things you can register in your Flink applications that allow your app to respond to the progression of time. Here's a Hello World Flink application torn out of um, Apache's source code um, in their examples. This is a word count application, and you can see how quick it, and easy it is to define a Flink app. Uh, these few lines of code take data out of, a, in this case, a file, and they count how many words are, uh, how many unique words are in that file. Um, I think this might be the right slide. Very finicky. OK. Um, so there's cases that what we're talking about here doesn't really apply. Um, so you need to ask yourself before you bother with any of this whether you should or not. Um, so if your performance isn't suffering, obviously, you should probably stick to um, whatever's working for you already. Generally, you'll begin writing Flink apps using these higher level operators like the one shown on the previous slide. Um, Without getting into the nitty gritty, the, the more primitive operators, uh, your app's gonna, the code's gonna look cleaner and more readable. Um, but, and also if your costs are negligible, there's no need to over optimize your code. Um, you may even have spare capacity on a machine running your application. So, without provisioning any additional resources, you could um, handle more load. But then there's some cases where you do need to start worrying about performance tuning. Um, for example, um, even though Flink applications are highly scalable, scalable this can actually be um, the downfall in some cases. Um, you could just sca infinitely scale machines up and incur higher and higher costs if you're not careful. Um, some uh, run times, for example, Amazon offers Kinesis data analytics will even auto scale for you. So this could be happening without your knowledge. Um, also, small changes in your code can have very large cost implications, um, basically referring to the previous point, I guess. Um, and then lurking scale, scaling bottlenecks, uh, such as some that we'll get into, that can be a big headache for your on-call staff or your, uh, whoever's maintaining the application. So the first big bottleneck that you'll probably encounter when writing a Flink application has to do with what's called serialization. Um, common term, but it means uh, something different in Flink or something with a special meaning. Um, serialization is what happens every time you need to send data over a network or write or read data from state. Um, and because Flink applications are often doing pretty light work logically, the serialization can often be the dominating uh, component of uh, CPU usage. Here's a quick diagram showing a Flink architecture, a Flink job graph. And there's arrows pointing to every point in this application where serialization and deserialization are occurring. And because it's so easy to make these um, complicated architectures using uh, Flink, you can end up with a lot of serialization and deserialization points um, with a very little code. So referring back to that previous example, you can see this innocuous looking sum operation. Um, 
every time you process a new, in this case, word from uh, your text file, what's happening is you're reading this integer out of state. Um, in most cases, that'll be some sort of persistent uh, state, like a RocksDB backend with a file backing. Um, you're incrementing that integer, and then you're writing that integer back to state. So performs well enough for, for on the order of thousands of elements, but if you're dealing with millions, billions, um, that can get expensive very quickly. Um, some things to know about serialization are Flink has a variety of built-in serializers, and some of these are um, much orders of magnitude faster than others. So um, you'll want to look into what serializer you're using. There's um, a lot of documentation about this because this is such a common problem. Um, and the runtime will choose the serializer for you based on um, what it knows about the available serializers. So this is something you don't have a lot of introspection into. Um, you'll, you'll register the serializers up front, but you'll need some sort of logging or um, perhaps looking at your profiler to see if it's choosing the right serializer. And because this is so expensive, there are techniques to avoid serialization, and you should probably try to do that whenever possible. Another thing, another place where you have to worry about serialization is rekeying or rebalancing of uh, data. Um, so you can imagine if you have two operations, referring back to that last one, we have that uh, sum operation. If you wanted to do, for example, another operation average, um, you want to be careful that you're not rekeying or rebalancing that data too much because that adds a whole other um, serialization, deserialization step to that chain. There is a built-in faculty in Flink called operator chaining. And when parallelization matches between operators and uh, when their keys are the same, it's able to perform the operations in sequence on a single machine. Um, and it doesn't actually require serialization to pass elements between each other, between tasks in that special case. And then there's this um, potentially dangerous feature called reinterpret as keyed stream, which is why I put a dragon next, next to it. Um, and this allows you to, key, to treat um, just an ordinary data stream as having a known keyed uh, partitioning scheme. And referring back to operator chaining, it can allow operator, ch operator chaining in cases where uh, Flink otherwise wouldn't have the knowledge to perform that. Um, and we use this just in a single operator uh, pair in one of our programs, and we saw a 20% reduction in the total CPU usage of the entire Flink cluster. For us, that re represented about $8,000 a month in savings. So ways to figure out if serialization costs are um, bottlenecking you. Like most things, you begin by looking at the Flink uh, job graph. This is provided in the web UI, available on all Flink applications. Um, this lets you see the red shaded areas where the worst performance is happening. And then you can attach your favorite profiler or um, use Flink provided flame graphs, which is a recently added feature to Flink. And that'll, that'll help you break down exactly what the uh, bottleneck is. You'll see serialization related elements on your flame graph if that's the issue. Um, already covered that. And then there's this additional concern with window functions, which are these very useful conceptual features that allow you to aggregate data based on some time barrier. Um, they reduce your code complexity a lot, but one potential issue with window functions is that the things that you can do to aggregate elements inside that window implicitly serialize state and deserialize it every time a new element is processed. So. This is a feature I always want to make take advantage of, and I usually begin writing programs by taking advantage of it. But um, thus far, I don't think I've a single window function that survived into production of the ones that we've used. Um, another pseudo hack that you can and probably will have to apply is to do some of your aggregation in memory, um, thereby bypassing any sort of flink state access. 
Um, so when you access something in memory, you're, you're just referring to the Java heap object. Um, Flink is a JVM uh, execution environment. So when you, when you do this, you'll avoid, oh, and we have a question coming up. Quick question on that. Yeah. So there's a real major problem with this because you know there's no protected threads on the Java heap. Mm -hmm. So that's why architectures like uh, Dart with protected memory threads isolates are leveraging a faster performance in the V8 um, the V8 um, uh, engine versus the actual Java engine. It's actually performant, more performant. So have you seen anything in Java that is anything near close to as fast as that? That's why Google wrote um, the um, uh, Flutter framework that's getting browser apps mm -hmm. the same speed as actual compiled OS apps in Java or even faster as, it, as the browsers get more conformant in memory management with the V8 compiler. Yeah, and, and definitely the JVM has a bad rap in the performance world. And I, I have a feeling it was chosen largely because a lot of uh, there was already a lot of familiarity with the languages in the um, data science world. And that day I was around, yeah. really, I remember when um, James Gosling was still at Sun for uh, Oracle Bottom, and then he went to Google, and then they built the Dart compiler with his <laughs> compiler guys because he said it was faster, and we fixed the Java heap issues. So that's why I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. So for Java folks, it, it lets you kind of develop like you do in Java because um, there's a uh, if you're an Android developer, Java Android, you can kind of plug into it. It's easier, but it's super fast because mm -hmm. it's using the rendering engine in the browser with app cache, browser cache and views inside of the OSs to actually drive the performance. And they're using the same SQLite storage engine in the OS and the browser. So it's, it's, it's a, some stuff you get trivial redundant memory, eventual consistency, because you've got three different caches. Yeah. It looks like uh, Zuab. <laughs> hey, uh, so in the three years you guys have adopted uh, Flink, how mm -hmm. has it been as a Golang shop having Java kind of mixed into your guys' code base? Uh, do you guys find it challenging? to get developers on, you know, ramped up to support the Java plus Go yeah. kind of architecture. And yeah, like well, how, how has that been cost in terms of just like developer? Yeah, setup? we we all took the change pretty pretty well, I think. <laughs> A lot of us um, are kind of Go bashers at this point, to be honest. Uh, um, we, we use Scala now, and we love um, all the additional features it has over Go. <laughs> oh, hey. Hey, have you guys looked at running uh, Apache Beam on your Flink clusters so that you can, you know, use Scala and Go <laughs> and Java yes. and Python and mix and match and have fun? Yeah, yeah, we've uh, looked at Beam a little bit. Um, Beam is basically something that abstracts over all these streaming frameworks and allows you to write an application that can target, for example, Spark or Flink. Um, some of the things we do we do here, like the one I'm about to talk about, is. Uh, Something that they want to be possible in Beam, um, because we're accessing like the primitives of the application. So, yeah, going back to in-memory aggregation, um, this is something that you'll end up create, recreating kind of MapReduce type workloads. Um, you're aggregating in memory um, and leaving more, um, I guess, the final aggregation um, where you're reducing everything down to the the unit of aggregation that you want to process over. Um, and it can be made fault tolerant, which is um, one of the biggest worries I had when I first started adopting this practice. And we'll show how. But it does forgo a lot of the nice framework features, like uh, Flink gives you an easy way to access state in, a, in the context of a, a key that you've sharded your data across. It's also constrained by your task manager's heap size. So task manager being the worker again, worker nodes. So this gives you a potential huge headache where you can actually crash your program by running out of memory. And it would be a nightmare to solve that sort of problem. And this state is also necessarily local to the task manager because it, again, for the same reason, because it lives on the JVM's heap. And you can't share this state across uh, different Flink tasks. So this is the compromise I alluded to. This is um, combining a feature that Flink has called checkpointed functions, which let you hook into the checkpointing algorithm to basically make your state consistent with the checkpoint. 
you can what you can do here is every time a checkpoint occurs, dump your in-memory state into the checkpointed state. Um, and every time you restore from a checkpoint, um, dump that into memory. And this gives you the performance of memory, but also some of the robustness, as long as your state size is manageable, which to fit on the JVM heap, it kind of has to be. Uh, you can use this technique. And the alternative to window functions, which I referenced uh, not working very well for us, is to use process functions, which are this more primitive uh, Flink operator. These give you the ability to register timers, um, emulating the behavior of a window function. Um, and they give you the ability to, uh, to actually allocate in-memory objects, such as the in-memory aggregation that you would be doing. So the next performance issue that we'll talk about is probably one very familiar to anyone who works in data pipeline applications. Uh, this is where some of your data is higher in volume than others in your data partitioning. Uh, so the, in this contrived example, you say you're generating an invo invoice for your customers, and your customers are sales uh, services. In this case, you have Joe's side project here, who might be doing one or two sales a day. Uh, you want to key over his data because you're generating his invoice. Then you also have Amazon.com, who's doing more than two sales per day. And they end up with a much hotter shard as a result. So anytime uh, your partition of data does, or you can't partition your data evenly, this, this problem arises. And it's not always sufficient to use a finer grain. Uh, this is often the attempt at solving this problem is to just break your data down into finer and finer buckets. The thought being that you can evenly spread a smaller number of keys, or a larger number of keys. keys. Um, but for example, in that invoice example, you really do eventually need all of Amazon's data in one place to develop that invoice. So the key here is to try and aggregate your data as early as possible to reduce that cardinality and try and even out the key um, partition sizes. And this is kind of just the MapReduce architecture. You have randomly distributed data in this in-memory aggregation. Uh, some of it that belongs together will end up together. Some of it won't. But it will all be aggregated into a smaller number of units, um, which following this key by will end up with exactly one unit for each key in this state-backed aggregation. We use. Uh, this technique for our flag evaluations counting, uh, I guess, feature. Um, what we do here is for every flag and every environment in LaunchDarkly, we offer this graph that shows how many times each flag has been evaluated for each variation. And that requires us to know that what we, we need to at one point in the application all of that data. Um, some flags are obviously evaluated a lot more frequently than others. So there's a huge imbalance in um, the partitions here. So what we did here is basically what that architecture diagram shows. We randomly uh, assign the keys at first, do some in-memory aggregation, um, and then periodically emit those, those uh, values downstream where they can actually be summed up into a single number that represents the um, flag evaluation total. And yeah. Uh, moving on, there's a third big performance bottleneck potentially in Flink applications. And this has to do with how time progresses in the application. Um, specifically, this concept of watermarking that applies to event time applications. Uh, as a reminder, that's when you're assigning uh, the meaning of time on your own based on some feature of the, re the data that you're reading in. Um, so this has implications for checkpointing, which occur on a regular schedule. Timers firing, which timer won't fire unless the watermark advances, and window function behavior. Each task has its own watermark. So I, I referred to tasks and operators as separate concepts earlier, um, an operator 
can have multiple instances, multiple parallel instances. And until all those instances advance, uh, the operator's overall watermark will not advance. Um, so basically, yeah, the operator watermark is defined as the minimum of all the individual task watermarks. Some things you need to think about um, as you think about watermarking in your application is how out of order can the source data be? If it's not too out of order, Flink provides ways of basically tolerating that. You can say, I expect this data to be up to a minute or two minutes old, and your watermark will steadily advance with that in mind. If it's very out of order, you will likely need to um, implement some other strategy. One thing we do, going back to that um, flag evaluation counter data example, is if our data is too far out of order, we will basically skip some of the intermediate database writing stages we do. And that gives us acceptable performance in cases where we otherwise wouldn't get it. Here's an example of a watermark uh, progressing. We have these two sources here, and these two sources are emitting two different watermarks uh, just based on the data they've received. And this is what can happen when you have skewed source data. So we have one, three, and four, the maximum. We've, we've defined the watermark here to be the maximum of all the observed uh, data. Top one, we have a max of 10. Bottom, we have a, a max of four. And as a result, the overall watermark is four for the um, operator that's basically taking the minimum of both of those. And if your watermarks aren't advancing smoothly, you end up with a slew of problems. Any work that you've queued up to happen, say on a timer firing when a watermark reaches a certain point, that'll keep getting queued up longer and longer until the watermark finally exceeds that point, um, at by which point you'll just have a, a potentially a huge amount of work to do all at once. And one technique I found in this uh, blog post here is sorting data. That's a good blog. I would recommend uh, re reading that. This is what sorting would do for you. Um, it basically balances the, um, the event timestamps of your source data such that the minimum is closer together than it would otherwise be, for the, even for parallel subtasks such as the ones emitted from sort. And then you have a second problem with source data, which is just a skew in the volume of data. Um, so if your data is not evenly partitioned, you can think about kinesis shards or um, if you have an S3 file source and one of your files is much larger than the other, you can end up with some readers that are taking much longer than others to read their data. There are some solutions offered by some of, the kinesis, some of the sources for Flink. Uh, kinesis gives you the option to have a, what, what they call a job manager watermark tracker that'll kind of try and coordinate all the watermarks of the Kinesis shards. Um, and it'll kind of tell readers who, are, who have more data to read than others to kind of hold on and slow down. Um, but unfortunately, that's an optional feature, so it's not available in all um, Flink sources. This is what imbalance looks like in one of our applications. We, we happen to use a Kinesis source. And because of this very naive shard assignment algorithm that Flink uses, all it's doing is hashing the Kinesis shard ID um, and mod modulo the subtask ID. Um, if that number is equal to 0, that subtask says, OK, this is my shard. I'm going to read its data. This leads to a pretty incredible amount of imbalance here. We, we have anywhere from zero to four shards assigned, which you can infer by seeing these are all just about multiples of 2.5 million on that record sent column. And this isn't such a problem for us, but you can see how this could become a problem. <laughs> There's no real great options of addressing this uh, using most of the existing Flink sources. There is this proposal that was accepted called FLIP27. So you're starting to see sources that um, implement that proposal. And that basically moves the, the job of assigning um, source tasks to the job manager, which, as you'll recall, is the thing that allocates work in the first place. 
So the job manager can know the global state of um, all the source shards. So instead of trying to infer what subtask should, or what if a particular subtask should own a, per, a particular shard, you could do more clever things like a round robin approach of assign, assigning work. So again, this isn't inherently bad. Often IO is not realistically a bottleneck. So unless it is, you probably don't need to take any action. But if you, if you are running into this problem, there's not a lot you can do. Uh, you could, for example, statically define the mapping of subtask ID and kinesis shard ID. Uh, it's kind of gross and re requires you to know, um, like for example, the name of your kinesis shards, how many shards are in the stream. And one final thing we'll talk about is probably obvious, but um, just code efficiency. Because the operator code is so tiny and doesn't do very much, you might just assume whatever you're doing in there is performant enough. And I've often made some assumptions that turned out to be wrong about whether a particular block of code is perform performant. So these hot paths can easily emerge and may exist if you don't verify they don't. As of, I think, Flink 112, 113, um, flame graphs have been available. Um, and these are invaluable for finding slow execution paths. They basically sample the JVM stack traces every so often. And they average, they, they average these stack traces across all the task managers and give you the percent of CPU time spent in each of uh, the shown methods. They do Wait. Hello. Oh, that, that feature is optional and needs to be specifically enabled, by the way. Um, this is one example of something that I took for granted as a very quick operation. Um, it's calling two string on a Scala enumeration type. Um, I had no idea why this might be slow. Digging into the source code, it looks like it might be because of a synchronized block around this uh, function. Whatever the reason is, this was taking 3% of our uh, CPU samples, <laughs> or present in 3% of our CPU samples, and that was very surprising. So what we did was implement a custom two-string method that returns a string constant for each of the enumeration, um, in, you know, for all the values in the enum, and that knocked it down to 0.08%, more in line with what you'd expect. Second example has to do with a slow random number generator. Um, all we wanted here was a unique ID, basically. We just wanted a uniform distribution to sample a unique ID from. Um, and we use UUIDs everywhere. Uh, by <laughs> so basically, by force of habit, we just continued using uh, UUIDs. And they definitely provide a good uniform distribution, but they were taking 6% of our CPU time. Um, and the culprit was probably that it was drawing these uh, random numbers from the secure random source using hardware entropy. Um, because we run these applications on a managed environment, we, we don't have control over this JVM setting. Uh, which can override where we draw this random source from. So we just instead used the good enough pseudo random number, number generator from Java. And that reduced the CPU time to 0.02%. So in summary, um, the high level operations are very useful um, and ergonomic, but they aren't always performant enough. Um, you'll often end up writing the, using the lower level operators Flink provides. Serialization and costs are huge and probably the number one place you should look for any performance issue. Um, be careful how you divide your data and aggregate it as early as possible. Address skew and source data, both in volume and time ordering. And be sure to profile. <laughs> And I wanted to shout out this talk that I discovered while working on this. Um, Brent Davis from Flink Forward 2021. 
he covers a lot of similar topics and he also goes into Flink configuration, which is useful if you're actually trying to put uh, some of this into practice and further tune your applications. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is a great talk. This is a, you know, dive so many details in many directions. Anybody has questions, if you raise a hand, I'll pass the mic. How about online? Somebody online? Go. No questions? <laughs> it's a little surprise. These are great, great topics. And I, I, I you know, I know I, I've been working on, not, not on Flink specifically, but on the Spark streaming side. And so I know that's uh, all the similar, yeah. <laughs> similar issues. Yeah, thank you, Blake. Cool. Um, you talked about the imbalanced algorithm when assigning source shards to the operators. Could you have achieved better results if you try to assign your incoming data to source shards better? I don't know if that's even a thing. Um, so basically the issue is every source, every t parallel instance of a source doesn't know about the other ones. So it's trying to figure out what data it should process. Um, without any knowledge of who's processing the other data. So basically, you just need some sort of algorithm that can um, try to even, evenly distribute the workload um, with zero knowledge of um, other task managers, if that makes sense. Um, and it, this isn't a great way to do it. And I guess that's why the FLIP 27 proposal um, proposed moving some of this work into the job manager where it can actually be coordinated. Other questions? Uh, any techniques to avoid data skew and stream processing apart from the um, S word, the swording, swording related technique? I'm not sure if that's right, but sharding, sharding, sharding related technique. Um, I assume this means like event time skew. Um, this is something we actually continue to struggle with. Our source data comes from a further up, up uh, in our case, a, a Lambda that's emitting data that it reads out of its own Kinesis stream. So right now when we encounter event time drift in that Lambda, that event drift uh, works its way down to our Flink application. Um, other than sorting it and buffering it for as long as you need to, to get a good sort order, I'm not sure there's great solutions. Um, one, one way to, for us to solve this, which we are realistically probably, probably not gonna be able to put the work into to do it, would be to somehow exert some back pressure on our upstream source so it can even out its own skew. Um, More questions online? Okay, if no more questions, I would like to thank Blake. A great talk. Thank you. <laughs> I think that's all for all the talks. So I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Robert and the lunch and darkly again to invite us to host, you know, host this meetup. So we have, you know, I guess they also provide all the food and drink still here, so people can social, you know, before the uh, we close the event. For people online, thank you so much for attending. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.